Tonight, our guest is the manager of the St. Louis Cardinals, Tony La Russa. This past week, La Russa got his 2,500th career win. That's third on the all-time list. His teams have been in five World Series, winning twice, once with Oakland in 1989, and then in 2006 with the Cardinals. La Russa is now in his 31st year as a big league manager, and as usual, he has his team in contention. La Russa has his share of critics, but even they would have to admit that at age 64, Tony La Russa still seems to be on top of his game. Make up any list of baseball's best managers and it's likely to have Tony La Russa at or near the top. Tony La Russa, they brought him here to get into a World Series. And despite injuries to key players, Frank Hill on the move, makes the catch and runs into the wall. La Russa's Cardinals have been at or near the top of their division all year. That's five straight wins. In this decade alone, his teams have won six division titles, and the Cardinals are the National League Central Division champions. And been to the World Series twice, winning it in 2006. Swing and a miss! The Cardinals are world champions! Tony La Russa has been a big league manager for three decades, from the White Sox to the Oakland A's and now the Cardinals. He recently won his 2,500th game as a manager. That's the third most in baseball history, behind only the legendary Connie Mack and John McGraw. And La Russa and Sparky Anderson are the only managers to win World Series titles in both leagues. The A's are the world champions. Beyond the numbers, La Russa has developed the reputation of being able to do more with less than just about any manager in baseball. All right, nice work. Good job. He's been the focus of two best-selling books, and he's a certain Hall of Famer. But La Russa does have his critics. If you disagree with that, write that you disagree with it. I don't care. I really don't. He overmanages, they say, changing pitchers so many times it makes your head spin. So Tony La Russa is going to the bullpen one more time. When he was dubbed the mastermind by Sports Illustrated years ago, some inferred that La Russa considered himself some sort of mastermind, and resentment ensued. But this much is beyond dispute. Tony La Russa is one of the most successful managers in baseball history, and he joins us now in Studio 42. And here he is, number 10 in Studio 42, Tony La Russa. As we speak, your Cardinals are in first place in the National League Central. A lot of people say it's a cliche, but they're overachieving. <laughs> Tony's doing it with mirrors. What's your assessment of this year's team? I think that uh, because we have a lot of guys that don't have a lot of experience at the talent level, it's, it's just not been recognized. We're, we're more talented than people know, and people don't haven't seen us enough to know how gritty I mean, this club plays hard. I mean, nothing deters them. We get our heart broken, they come out and play. We play good, they don't back off, they're relentless. So, you know, we're better uh, than people know yet. We're a little thin. I mean, we have some issues, like I don't see anybody that's perfect, but uh, we can be competitive. Primary issue, you have the guy who, by overwhelming consensus, is the best player in the game, Albert Pujols. He doesn't have much protection in the lineup. Uh, Ludwig behind him hit 37 homers, drove in over 100 a year ago, but doesn't have the reputation of a long period of performance, and this year he's down around 230, 240. So you got the best guy with no protection. You need something by the trade deadline, don't you? Well, I'd, I'd have to quarrel with no protection. You know, the guy's... Less than you want. Right. I mean, you know, we get some protection, but the reality is you've got Albert, and uh, there's a special responsibility, a special pressure on those guys. And when they're swinging good, they handle it. But when they're struggling, it makes it harder for them. Supposedly, Pujols wanted the Cardinals to make a run at Raul Abanez, who wound up signing with the Phillies and until he went on the DL, doing extremely well. Now we hear that Matt Halliday may, might be available if the price is right from Oakland. Do you hope the Cardinals make a run at Holiday? I hope that we make our best effort, Bob. I mean, I've been through this before. You, you, it's really a difficult place for a manager or a coach. If you start talking too much about what you need, what you need, what does your team think? Oh, unless we get that need, we can't compete. That's a, exactly the wrong message that you send your team. But you always acknowledge that uh, you're not perfect and you're always trying to get better. So to me, as long as our organization is, is trying, there's other clubs that are going to be competing for whatever the need is, then, then, then we're good with that. We're hitting midseason. You're at the top of what looks like a competitive division. The Brewers were a playoff team a year ago. Cubs were the best team in the league a year ago, and now they're starting to get hot as we speak. 
So I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but any manager would hope that his team's front office would step up and give him the resources to compete to October. I just think that uh, the most realistic approach is, you know, I remember Catfish used to say something that I, I quote a lot to coaches, our coaches, to our players, and to myself. It's not being perfect, it's trying to be perfect. As long as our front office and our ownership is trying to be perfect, you have no complaints. This is a very competitive situation. Let's take a look at some footage of Albert Pujols, who is just about unconscious. Uh, I, if there's a way to get him out, if there's a book on this guy, I don't think it's been published yet. Let's just take a look at Albert Pujols, first at regular speed and then in slow motion. Albert has great confidence in his hands. And that's why a lot of times you don't see him overstride and he just kind of picks his foot up and put it, puts it down. So part of his greatness is he's never out of balance and his swing path, he hits that ball in the inside corner down the left field line by staying inside it doesn't hook foul. He takes the ball away back on the plate and extends through it and hits the ball out of the park like a left hand pull hitter. But that's only part of the story. And this is one of the things you tell young players when they come in. You've got a chance if you'll take advantage of it. From the first day of spring training, you watch Albert. You do everything Albert does. And almost without exception, I look around, they're not doing it all because it's just too hard. This guy works and works. He's smart, knows his strokes. He studies the game between him and the pitcher, and he's got great courage at the plate. And then you tie all that into this number one quality. He's just trying to win the stinking game. So when he goes to bat, if you need the rally started, he'll take and punch a single. If you got a guy on first or two outs, he's going to take a little bigger hit, maybe get an extra base hit. This guy is a winning player. He's the best player I've ever been around. The best player you've ever been around. And I say that, I said that actually the second year after his rookie year, just watching this guy. And I said, with no disrespect to all the great players that have been teammates over the years, and certainly others we've played against, I don't mean disrespectfully, but Albert, I really be in my mind, is a perfect player. His walk totals, both technically unintentional and technically intentional, are way, way up there. Now, as we speak, with the bases loaded this year, he's five for five with three grand slams. The other two times, he got two RBI hits. So in five bases loaded at bats, he has 16 RBIs. Are we to the point where it was with Barry Bonds, for whatever reasons, different situation maybe, are we to the point where guys should walk him with first base occupied in some situations? Yeah, I believe that uh, in a late game situation, if you were up by two and Albert came up with two outs, yeah, I'd walk him. Deep left field. Unbelievable. People ask why the pitcher hits eighth. Pitcher hits eighth because a position player hits ninth. It's three guys that might get on base ahead of him. And the more guys that get on, there's only two ways that you put the bat in Albert's hands. There's actually three. One is protection behind, which we talked about. The other one is have guys on base. By definition, if there's three guys on base, that's pretty painful to walk the guy. And the last one is if, you know, the other side is, in which I really think is our attitude that we had with Barry Bonds, you know, you're there to, to raise, you know, I remember Philippe Lou said it, you raise competitors, not cowards. It's, it's, it's uh, you send the wrong message to your club when you're just saying, we're going to take this guy out of the game, we're not going to challenge him. Pitchers don't like it. The club says, wait a minute, this is, this is not, let's just beat their best. So I, I think there's a lot of competitive fire on the other side, and, they're going to walk Albert some, but they're going to compete against him, as they should. So hitting the pitcher eighth was an idea that intrigued you for a while, but it's especially appealing when Albert Pujols is hitting third for you. Well, the first time I ever tried it was in 1998, and we were having a horrific time scoring at the end of the first half, and that was Mark, who was setting home run records. At the All-Star break, we had a workout, and I asked two of the guys that I think were one is and one was, uh, great baseball men and mentors, George Kissel and Red Shandings. And I asked him, I said, look, you know, we got to get Mac in the game because we're not scoring. And if there's another position player instead of the pitcher, won't we have more base runners? So it started with McGuire, did it the second half of the 98 season, and then with Albert. I think it makes sense. And every once in a while, sure, the pitcher comes up, and you think, well, if there's a player there. But on, on balance, without a doubt in my mind, creates more opportunities. Tony La Russa with us from Studio 42. More to come with the skipper of the Redbirds after this.
Continuing our conversation with Tony LaRusso from Studio 42, more than 2,500 wins, third all-time behind Connie Mack and John McGraw. You want to talk about legendary names from the distant past. So actually number one among any managers that could be called modern managers, and yet everybody has their critics. And in your case, one of the criticisms is about overmanaging. Let's let Dennis Eckersley respond to that. Hmm. I used to think that. <laughs> When I was on the other side of the field, I'd say, look at this guy, you know, you know trade, you know, left, right, left, right, you know, but I'll tell you what, he knows what he's doing. It makes sense. When you get involved in it and you see how, what the plan is, it works. It makes all the sense of the world. And you've seen how the game has changed. It's, 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 you know, all specialized. And it makes sense because everybody's in the mix. Everybody, you know, you're not going to the bullpen once every week with somebody. Everybody knows what their job is. And you have to be used on a regular basis to, you know, for it to work. Everybody puts their piece in, and I think he's just orchestrated it fabulously. Was there ever a time, looking back, and I know you're very self-critical, ever a time when you say to yourself, yeah, I overmanaged a bit? Well, I think it, uh, I'm a product of what I've been taught, and I think I've had great teachers, and they all tell you, you're better off making a move that you think makes sense than sitting around not making a decision. The use of the bullpen comes up a lot. And uh, I'm just a product of the evolution. I mean, way back when I was starting to pay attention <clears throat> as a player and then later on as a, as a young manager, you know, in 70, those A's pennants, Dick Williams used the pen. You know, Billy with, I mean, relievers, Sparky. Those guys all use relievers. It just keeps evolving because you want to make the at-bats as tough as possible towards the end of the game. And I think most hitters will tell you they would rather face a really good tiring starter for the third or fourth time than the specialty guy comes out that you see maybe three or four times a year. The other thing that we're managing is that sometimes uh, with maneuvering defensive players and all that, and here's the, the, I think the subtle, not so subtle point. More and more guys come to the big leagues as young players without the benefit of a bunch of minor league experience. So there's more teaching that goes on, more learning goes on at the big league level. So when a, you know, a player said, man, you know, why don't you just let us play? I said, well, the guys that know how to play, we let play. But the guys that don't know how to play don't know when to run. So you have an outfielder that stands in the same spot, no matter who the hitter is, no matter what the count is, 2002. You let those guys play and let no, you, you have to put your two cents in. And I think that's what managers have to do nowadays. You've had an effect on the evolution of the game strategically because it was you, at least the first guy who prominently identified the idea. My closer is going to be a closer, not going to be a fireman. He's going to close the game out. Not long before that, a Bruce Souter, a Goose Gossage could come in in the seventh inning and then complete the game. And we all understand the idea that there's a different mentality in working the ninth. But doesn't there need to be some flexibility in this? Aren't there times in a key game when the most important outs might be in the seventh or eighth inning? And so you're not asking your guy to get a, a, a two-inning save. You're saying, come in now, get us out of this, and we'll figure out what we do next. Well, first of all, uh, what I identified for that ninth inning closer, I identified that Dave Duncan knew exactly what he was talking about when he said that's how we should do it. So it wasn't my idea. It was Dave deserves the credit. The other thing about that, before we get to the, the, the specific about using the closer earlier, you know, if you have a good club that you have a chance to be ahead often, that's when it's nice to have him available for the ninth. If your club is not that competitive, use him whenever you have a chance to win. Get outs in the eighth and ninth because he's your best guy. So I think that transition sometimes has not been part of the decision-making of teams because they thought ninth inning closer. But you know, one of the situations that I think you have to read during the course of the season, sometimes you play a truly impactful game. It has significance beyond just that win, that loss. And one of the points that you come to as a manager is if this game gets away, our club has to walk into that clubhouse and feel like we did our very best. Player's effort. Coach's effort, manager's decision. In that case, I often enough will pitch the closer in the eighth inning to get those key outs. It may be the middle of the lineup, and if you don't get those guys up, you'll never see the ninth. And the reason you do it, if that game gets away, you want the club to feel like, hey, we lost with our best. But normally, if you've got a good club, the more often that closer is available, the more effective, more, chance, more games you win. You said once that even when you were a player, middle infielder, that it was harder to play against aggressive teams, teams that pushed, 
because as you <clears> put it, teams that played station to station, all you have to do is play the ball. Right. If guys are moving and doing aggressive things, or even there's the possibility that they might, it takes more out of you, both mentally and physically. So it isn't just the specific strategy, it's the toll it takes on the opposition over the course of a series. Absolutely. I mean, this is, and here again, this is nothing that I invented. This is stuff that was uh, taught, or I played for guys that demonstrated this, or you played against guys, and you went, wow, you know, I'm worn out after nine innings because they might hit and run. If I'm a third baseman, they'd bunt for base hits, so I got to play in, I play back. Uh, the more that you're giving the other side to think about, the more possibilities you have that you can distract them a little bit, gain an edge. That's why a guy like Ricky, for example, what a force he was, not just for him stealing bases, but how he disrupted the defensive side of the ball. And I think, you know, you try to be pushy offensively, and you try to be real basic and uh, fundamental defensively. Henderson was a Hall of Fame player for you. For a while, Canseco was an all-star player for you. How frustrating were they to deal with personally? Uh, you know, both are, it's so difficult to talk about both of them because they're separate. You know, in Jose's case, uh, early on, had a great relationship, great potential. And then, as has happened to a lot of guys, he got a lot of money early and it distracted him. And he got off of being a great player and he was a great personality. And then later on, I think when he started coming to his senses, he started getting hurt. Uh, and then we know the issues with, with steroids, so that's, you know, that's another explanation. In Ricky's case, uh, I think there's a misconception about Ricky as a teammate. Ricky was a really good teammate. And almost every manager that I know enjoyed him, including me. It's just that once in a while, what was good for Ricky wasn't what the manager perceived what was good for the team. And that's where we butted heads a couple of times. But when you had the career he had, Bob, <clears throat> probably turns out that he was right. You know, tell me every once in a while, you know, hey, I can't go today, because he probably felt like his legs would blow. But uh, Ricky Henderson was a delight to have on a team and a great weapon. Mark McGuire did great things for you in both Oakland and especially in St. Louis. You always stood by him when controversy came along. Now some time has passed and there's a weight of the evidence situation. How do you feel about it in retrospect? Well, I would take the past tense out of that and, and, and say it's, it's still the current. Um, you know, what I've said from the beginning, I say it now. <clears throat> we ran uh, uh, an intense, um, program of strength and fitness in Oakland and St. Louis. It was monitored, it was supervised. The guy that had the biggest impact was a, a man named Dave McKay who's been with me since 1986. He's got as much or more integrity than any man I've ever met in baseball. Uh, there wasn't anything illegal happened in the official Oakland and St. Louis program and that's what I've defended because I saw all our guys in both those places work their butts off and get stronger legally. Now, what I've never said is, away from the ballpark, I'm not a policeman. We were not policemen. Did something happen? I don't know. I just know in Mark's case, I watched him from his first year, month in 86, through his rookie year and many years subsequent, religiously working to get stronger and also being very careful with his diet and stuff. So I believe that, uh, I believe everything I know about him was legitimate. Uh, if he strayed, I don't think he strayed much at all or... I never saw it, so I think he is a, a guy that I should speak up in, for him, in favor of, and I continue to do so. There's no question that he worked like crazy, not just to get stronger and be fit, but he was a student of hitting, which people don't always think of when a guy is that powerful, they think he's Paul Bunyan, but he was a very sophisticated guy in his approach to hitting. He was also an admirable teammate, and there's many things you can really respect about him as a person. But when you see him before Congress, and you see what's happened since, you're forced to conclude, not necessarily to condemn him as a person, but forced to conclude that something must have been going on that gave him a boost above and beyond his ability and his, and his effort, don't you think? Well, what I think is that uh, the congressional appearance was, was uh, a disappointment. Uh, I said, and I believe, I know he told me going in, he had hired these lawyers. I think he was coached. Uh, Mark has never been comfortable in the spotlight. Sure. And I, I don't think he thought very well on his feet or on his seat that day and he, he just fell back on that one answer. Uh, part of what people saw in 98, for example, was Mark more shy than Sammy. And they took him for being aloof and, and not approachable. And he was one of the best teammates you can have. Uh, you know, that's, that's what I see. I see the work. I know that he is a shy guy. Uh, 
but I also know now that he's, he's, he and Stephanie are raising their boys and, and he is avoiding the spotlight. And I also know that he went from a guy who didn't just wanted to see it and hit it to being a very, very smart hitter who works with a lot of kids in California on their stroke, including some of our professionals like Skip Schumacher and, and Chris Duncan. So I think he has a lot to offer. I keep asking him to come back. Yeah. I think when he comes back, I hope he does. Uh, I think just getting back out where people see him and, and maybe can approach him and he can answer whatever the questions are, uh, I, I think it's got a chance to maybe bring him back and, and get him in the Hall of Fame. Tony LaRusso, more from Studio 42 coming up. Back now with Tony LaRusso. I've known you for a long time, since early in your tenure with the White Sox. And one thing I know is your great regard for your colleagues, for the history of the game, how much you like to be around baseball men like the late George Kissel in St. Louis or Paul Richards or Al Lopez or whomever it may be. And so when George Will wrote an article off of his book, Men at Work, <laughs> that appeared in Sports Illustrated in the early 90s, and here's the picture, and it says, the mastermind. Don't want to see it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that mortified you, right? Yeah, in fact, he called me, he says, uh, there's a piece coming out in Sports Illustrated. He says, and you're not, I just saw the cover. You're not going to like the cover. And he underestimated me. I hate the cover. It, took, it, it became a great experience that to this day, you said mortifies. I mean, if somebody brings it up, I'll sign it. And I sign up a cover, you know. George's idea for the book was men at work. He picked four people in baseball. And he was going to write how they did their work. So the coaches and I, we just gave them and we were delighted to be part of fans understanding how the coaching side went versus the hitting pitching. And then all of a sudden that came out and it coincided, you know, the A's were really good then. The mastermind, which is the worst thing that you can, you can label that you can have. The attention is one of the worst things that can happen to a coach. Any coach or manager that gets headlines and attention is working against his purposes. Now, sometimes you've been around a good situation, you know, like Phil Jackson's won 10 championships. He's going to, he, going to get some attention, but it's not good for the team if you get too much of it, and that was an embarrassment. But you know, if your methods are a little different, if there's something about you which people find compelling or intriguing, and if you're successful, a certain amount of attention is going to come to you. And you love the game so much, not that other managers don't, but you're so thoroughly involved in it that people find not just what you do intriguing, but what motivates you to do it. That was a huge part of Buzz Bissinger's book, Three Nights in August. Not just the specific moves, but why is it that the game has such a hold on you? Why is it that a man with your broad interests in the baseball season can scarcely think of anything else? You know, Bob, uh, my dad introduced me to the game when I was four or five years old, and I've loved it ever since. And like uh, other things for other people, the more that I've been around the game and learned the game, from other people or just being a part of it, uh, I love it more than ever. And what I found was that there are a lot of fans out there that have a love of it and have an interest in it. And if you just sat around and talked to them and you told them about what all that goes on there, they just light up like a Christmas tree. Oh, really, really? And they enjoy, enjoy the game more. You know, we just talked a little bit ago. You know, where you stand as an outfielder when it counts 2-0 and versus 0-2. That's fascinating stuff, and the game has got hundreds of those things happening every game. This is what even the knowledgeable fan or person in the press box does not fully appreciate. They think the move is, do I steal here? Do I put the take sign on? Do I pinch hit? Do I sacrifice? Do I go to the bullpen? And those are the important moves. But there are moves within that that change not just batter to batter, but pitch to pitch within the count. And it's mentally exhausting to manage a baseball game because you can't fail to focus for even one pitch, or at least you shouldn't. If you do your job right, and uh, you know, that's one of my big arguments against you know, the money ballers and the computer simulus, uh, simulus, simulate, right. and they'll give you a printout that say, you know, if it's a third inning and this is what, this is a percentage, well, baloney, you watch the game and the strategy can differ based on all kind of variables. And that, for a coach, you know, we get into that stuff. I mean, that's, how, that's your contribution. You don't play, the game is for the players, but Coaching is about putting guys in a position to succeed. The take, the this, and the bullpen, all that. Every one of those things, you can break those things down into about 50 pieces. 
In any one of those, the, the competition is so close that to tip it in your direction, if you just do a couple little things right, that could be the difference. And that's the challenge of coaches, and that's what we try to push with players. Big things and the little things. You touched on this earlier. Do you see any benefit at all to sabermetrics, to the money ball approach? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I would I, think so. Yeah, I mean, when I first came in the league, they had all these great managers, and I was I had parts of two years in the minor leagues. So the preparation part was part of the survival, just to narrow the big gap between what those guys were giving their teams with their experience and what I didn't have. And I still believe that you know preparation is a big part, especially nowadays. You have so many uh, ways to prepare your team with the video and so forth. So the stuff that they pr produce is really important to give you an idea of how you match up. So you want this information. You want, in the big view, if you're thinking about acquiring a player, you want ballpark effects. Right. You want uh, his stats versus the league average. You want all those things, but you don't want to throw out what the baseball man sees and feels in the moment based on his lifelong experience. It's a great way to explain it. I mean, imagine if you lost a game and you figured out later on that on the bench was Bob Casas, who was... Nine for ten off of this pitcher. Well, and I you like pick, the sound of that. <laughs> yeah. And you picked Tony, who was one for ten. You mean you'd, you'd want to commit suicide. So the preparation part of it, the acquisition part, I mean, that's all very useful information. But you need to mix in and I think give the dominant position to the visual, the scout who goes out there and is judging hustle, judging clutch kind of show up versus disappear. And in the game itself, you know, if they tell you ahead of the game, you know, this is how you use your bullpen today, and this is what you plug in in any situation, it's malarkey because the game that day is different, and a player that you might have thought was a good hitter has got a slow bat, a guy that you didn't fear is having a career day. All that stuff means men, not machines. Take the preparation, have an idea about it, and then watch the game and trust your gut. Coming up next from Studio 42, the 1988 World Series, and the Kirk Gibson miracle. Three and one. And he walked it. And look who's coming up. Look who's coming up indeed. By way of review, and most fans, especially those who follow our network, know, you had a 4-3 lead going to the bottom of the ninth, game one, 1988 World Series. You've got the nearly invincible Dennis Eckersley on the mound. Two out, nobody on, and Kirk Gibson has been declared out of the game. That's the idea. He's out of the game. He's not available. And Dave Anderson, not a huge threat, is in the on-deck circle. When Vin Scully says, look who's coming up, are you like most of the people watching? Are you like, wow, I didn't expect that? No, I think that uh, knowing Kirk Gibson, and to this day, one reason that it doesn't hurt more than it does is that Gibson and Eckersley were exactly the same, great competitors. And when you're watching a competition between two great ones, whoever wins, if it's your guy, great. If you lose, you tip your cap. I have no problem tipping my cap to, to Kirk. He's just so when you have that kind of guy on the bench or unavailable, there could be. I mean, there, maybe there's a, a run on second and third with two outs, and all you do is stand there and just try to. I mean, he may be the best thing. So we didn't factor him out. We were ready for him. We had our scouting report. In fact, one of the classic moments that maybe we can reveal here: uh, the count goes two strikes right away. There's a shot of Dave Duncan in, the, in, the, uh, in our dugout, and he does this. He goes, Vin misunderstood that. He says, I think Duncan's moving the third base into the line. No. What Dave was telling Hassey was, we get two start. We're going to finish him up, out over the plate, and up. And to this day, uh, you know, he missed a couple of times, and he threw him that slider that he stole on, then he threw that backdoor slider that Mel Didier said, right. which is probably, you know, although, like X says, you know, he didn't go 3-2 too, too many times. But just, but just for background, Mel Didier was the advanced scout, right. and Kirk Gibson had it in his head right. that Didier had told him, if it gets to 3-2, and two, you can count on Eckersley throwing you the backdoor slider. So he's waiting for it, and he hits it. So the only regret, besides the fact we lost, which I think was pivotal for that series, um, was it Dave and all his smartness and coolness under pressure. When the catcher looks at him in a key situation, he's not looking away like a lot of coaches do and managers do. You're on your own, he told him, out of the plate and up. And if Eck would have thrown that fastball like in 1988, he struck out Wade Boggs on, 
then I, I think the, that game would have turned out differently. Or maybe Kurt might have blooped it in and tied the score. So here it is. Here's the pitch on three and two. And I hate to do this to you, but mm. you've seen it before. And you told me once that it still kind of haunts you. No, it's 21 years later. Here it is. What, do you, what are you thinking as this ball leaves his bat? Here we go. He had to have gotten it just on the sweet spot because he had almost no stride. Yeah, he just flipped it. Flipped it and hit it a long, long way. Now, he's making his way around the bases here. I'm and not watching. You know, you, you, <laughs> you've turned away at this point. The, the thing is, now they've stolen this game right. in one of the all-time miracle finishes. Now, they've got Hershiser. Right. who's on one of the all-time runs. Right. It's, it's not just Cy Young. I mean, he's lights out at this point. He's set the consecutive scoreless innings record, breaking Drysdale's mark. So he's going to pitch at home the next day. Right. All of a sudden, you got the best team in baseball. you got a good chance to go down 2-0, and you do. They had Hershiser. He beats this game, too. The second mugging that we had, we won game three. Mark hits the home run off a of howl in the ninth or tenth inning. So the next day, which is game four, we had to win that game to even it, and then we would have gone seven. Who knows what would have happened? Because we would have still had to beat Hershiser once to win the thing, I think. And uh, we lost game three. That, to me, the game, the, four. The, game four. Losing game four was really the, uh, the worst thing that happened to us in that series. Many of the greatest managers and coaches of all time, simply because they get to the big game so often, lose a lot of them. Shula, Landry, lost Super Bowls. Weaver lost more World Series than he won. Whitey Herzog, same thing, and lost tough playoff series against the Yankees when he was in Kansas City. You're a guy who gets the most out of your teams, gets them to overachieve over time. For three straight years, you had the best team in baseball, and you won one of those three World Series. Same thing that happened with Earl Weaver's Orioles at the end of the 60s and beginning of the 70s. But that grates. You had the best team all three times, and you lost two of them. You're right, and uh, I thought... We mugged it against the Dodgers, not because they were not good, because they were hurt. They didn't have their team out there. So we had a decided advantage, and we didn't take advantage of it. Uh, the, the, uh, the 90 series against the Reds, the Reds were a good team. They had a, a good bullpen. In fact, one of the stories of that, they beat us four games, and their bullpen was barely a factor. They just beat us. I thought in 90 we had started to celebrate ourselves too much. We had lost an edge. You know, It was more about doing the show than doing the game. Uh, so we, we should have gotten beat four. In, both, in all those, I say, you know, if you make it a seven-game series, you're competitive. To get beat four games is embarrassing. Uh, one thing you learn, though, you know, I, I know I've heard over the years, you know, maybe your intense style works for the regular season, doesn't work in the postseason. You know, our division record with the uh, Cardinals is exemplary. One of the toughest playoffs you can play is three out of five. What I settle in my mind, and this is here again, stuff that I've heard over the years, eight teams qualify now. You could probably see the number one team and the eighth team, but the eighth team can win a short series. Sure they can. It's, it's, it's not a crapshoot. It's about playing your best at key moments. And if you can get hot and stay hot, then any team that qualifies for the playoffs can be the world champion. And that happened to us in 06, and that happened against us other times. Later uh, in his life, when you joined the Cardinals, Jack Buck, the late, great Jack Buck, became one of your closest friends. He had a call on radio. Vin Scully was on TV. I don't believe what I just saw. Right. You didn't believe what you just saw then either, did you? No, I got to say, it, I was really concerned at that point because of Kurt's two-strike approach that, that he could beat us with contact somewhere. Little ground ball, little blooper. I, that's the only thing in my mind I never, ever contemplated. And I usually what if the worst. But my what if he never included a home run. Gibson swings and a fly ball to deep right field. This is going to be a home run. Unbelievable. A home run for Gibson. And the Dodgers have won the game 5-4. to four. I don't believe what I just saw. I don't believe what I just saw. <laughs> few more things to talk about with Tony La Russa before we conclude this installment of Studio 42. Uh, we heard the late, great Jack Buck a moment ago. I think people who haven't been around St. Louis can't fully appreciate what his standing was in that community. It's just not enough to say that he was one of the greatest announcers of all time. Fans always loved their longtime announcer in whatever community, and rightly so. But he had a place in St. Louis that went beyond broadcasting. He dies in 2002. 
He literally lays in state, his body lays in state at Bush Stadium. And only a few days later, Darryl Kyle dies in his hotel room in Chicago. I don't know of any team, at least in recent memory, that has been hit that hard that way in such a short period of time. And you had to manage that team as they mourned, and you got them to the playoffs. Well, it was incredible. Um, I mean, there's so many things that happened that year. <clears throat> I, I, for the team's sake, you lose Jack. Jack was like a part of us. To lose Darrell, who was tied for first with the best teammate, team leader, and great pitcher that you can ever have, that we've ever experienced. Uh, so it was, it savaged our club. I mean, our ball club, all of a sudden, they were supposed to be playing a game, but you know, they're, they're revisiting their priorities about family, life. And it was tricky, because you know, we've talked about it. Everything as a manager and as our coaching staff is stuff we've taught, we've been taught, you've learned it. Well, nobody ever taught the lessons about that. And we were really scrambling. If you played lifeless for a day or two, do you want to come off and disrespect their feelings and, and Darrell Kyle and his family by yelling and screaming? So it was really a, a position that was, was new and not wanted. And, and, and as a staff, did a lot of soul searching. You know, you know how, how are you compassionate? What's the right thing to do? Don't really know, don't really know. And I think uh, in a dramatic way, there was a, a column written by Bernie Miklas, who's uh, you know, our, you know, our number one columnist in, in St. Louis. And he wrote about Darrell's own words about his dad's death. And in it, it said the hard truth is that we must continue to play. And I remember standing in front of the team and said, look, even now, when he's gone, Darrell's helping us. This is how we should present. And I used Darrell's quote for the team. And that team gutted it up, ended up winning, ended up... Uh, Winning our division, ended up beating out of Arizona, the, the world champions in the, in the uh, division series. To this day, when I'm asked about these World Series heartbreaks and, and other things, the most disappointed I've ever been in uniform was when the Giants beat us in the NLCS in Game 5. Because I felt like this club was so destined. You know, I mean, we we're so tough that somehow this was going to, we were going to get paid back for that. So when we beat Arizona, uh, we going against the Giants, you know, I thought we were going to win. And even when we got down three games to one, I said, well, yeah, we're going we're to win this thing. So uh, that club, the guys that were part of that club, I mean, have that bond forever because we, we dealt with this terrible tragedy uh, and somehow gutted it out and, and kept our professional thing going and became very close. You were a big bonus baby. Fifty grand was a big deal <laughs> in the 1960s when you were signed by Kansas City. You got hurt early up and down, majors, minors. You hit 199 lifetime. That's one point less than Bob Euchre. You had seven career RBIs. And I think it was <laughs> George. Many? You had seven, seven. I, I think it was George Will who quoted you saying, I played till I was 32, but I should have quit at 24 because I kept getting worse. Now, it's a cliche when people say a lesser player makes a better manager because he appreciates all levels of the game. But is there some truth in that? And no. is part of what motivates you the fact that your love of the game was not fulfilled by your performance as a player. Well, I think it has helped me because I've been able to stay in the game at the major league level and experience things I never experienced as a player. You know, postseason opportunities, postseason success. But uh, no, uh, I heard that. You know, the worst players make the best managers. I think when you're not a good player, you, you know, you do for survival uh, learn things about the, all parts of the game. But, I, you know, I look back at uh, some of the great players. You know, Joe Torre was a really good player. Dusty Baker, Jim Fragosi, uh, Don Baylor, Lou Pinella. I mean, and they're, they're terrific managers. So what I've come to, in fact, I used to talk to George Kissel about this a lot. I think the formula is love of the game, desire to learn it. So you can be a really good player, you can be a really bad player. But if you love the game and you really want to learn it, then you, you can be a manager if, uh, if you've got the personality for it. Back now with Tony La Russa. You don't suffer fools gladly. Sometimes if a member of the media is sloppy in your mind, ill-prepared, or you don't know what his motivation is, you, you've been known to get contentious. I'm mostly contentious when uh, 
I think somebody is baiting a response that, to get something going. Right that you disagree with it. I don't care. I really don't. What I care is that I don't put my stamp any way, shape, or form on a cheap shot like that to, to a major league organization. I'm saying it. I'm saying it right now. You know, if somebody asks a question that, that you know, I've got 40 years of baseball experience and they've got four, I, I, I don't, I, I really, I try not to be. I, I think my parents would be very upset with me if I would embarrass that, that person. But I don't, I don't take the baiting very well because I don't like the controversy that's made up. There's enough sparks that fly normally that you don't need to get into anything. You know, if you ask, well, why'd you use this guy and you didn't use that guy and he's trying to go run the other guy, or, I, I, don't, I don't tolerate that too well. Sports talk radio, the blogosphere? Well, I, during the winter, I like to listen to political uh, talk. Uh, I will listen to sports talk during the winter. During the season, I never listen to it. I listen to, when I'm driving around, I listen to the, uh, XM Comedy. A little George Carlin, a little Richard Pryor. You know, like Lewis Black, Kathleen Madigan. You know, I mean, there's so many great comics. Some people might be surprised to hear you say that you're driving around, you're listening to the XM Comedy Channel, because some fans who've watched you for a long time <laughs> would say, you know, I've never really seen them laugh. And it's only those of... <laughs> He's auditioning a smile here. <laughs> Many of us have been in situations where you let your guard down and, and you, you howl with laughter. But you're so intense when most people see you, when the game is on, you understand how they could get that impression. Yeah, I do. I mean, I've been accused rightfully of being humorless, which I think I probably am. Um, but I, I, I keep looking at the other dugout, and I rarely see the other manager having a good time. Why? Because you've got a lot of responsibility, and your total responsibility is making decisions and tracking where your players are, you know, emotionally. And so that takes concentration. And the other thing, I think this is really important. It just happened this week a couple times to other clubs. You get that big lead with a three outs, six outs to go, and you start relaxing and having some fun, and that thing gets away, you'll, you lose one of those. You'll never disrespect the baseball gods again. So I grind for nine innings what ifing the worst if i get we're up by 10 i think they're going to score 11 and i i'm just not going to give in to it and, and that's what you tell the players all the time you control your mind and i i'm going to i'm going to not disrespect the other team we're playing against or the gods of baseball in keeping with that here's your hall of fame closer dennis eckersley once again one of the most intense guys i've ever met and intense to the point of just paying attention i mean he never takes an inning off not that managers do but he's just there's never anything happy-go-lucky. He is always, I mean, you'll ask him. I mean, I think he thinks if he's better than another manager is that he pays attention for 162 games, never takes an inning off. And that's intense. You know, there's been guys that played with him and said, God, this guy's intense every day. Like, what's wrong with that? There was an incident your first year managing the Cardinals, 1996, if I've got this right. John Mabry, one of the mm. nicest guys. You know where I'm going. John, one of the nicest guys ever, John Mabry. So he's... He's either playing first base or he's on first base. And Fred McGriff either is playing first or he's the hitter. It doesn't matter. They're standing at first base. They're playing the Braves. And now they're laughing. You know, so they say to something to each other, and they're smiling and laughing. And you're really ticked off. And you confront Mabry after the game, right? To this day, every time I see John, I apologize. I probably apologize from 100 times. Uh, 96, you know, the, the Cardinals had a nice nucleus. But a lot of the guys were kind of like, whatever happens, happens. Instead of you learn, you know, you have to make things happen. So, you know, Walt hired me to push. So we were starting to get it going. We we're playing the Atlanta Braves, and we, were, we got something going. You know, they're, they're starting to play harder and understand you got to make it happen, all this stuff. So we, we have a, like a five or six run lead, and Bobby Cox manages one of the best games I can remember against us because he starts pinch hitting his key late gamers in key, switches, key situations early to get back in it. Um, you know, so it's one of those games after you say, you know, you son of a gun, you're really good. Well, the game's getting away from us. And sure enough, they come back and take the lead. About the eighth inning, I said, you know, this is going to be really a tough loss. I don't know how we're going to rebound. John Mabry's playing first base. McGriff gets on. And, you know, McGriff's got a great personality. John's a great guy. They say something, they laugh. And I'm sitting there, you know, seeing this game get away, and I'm, you know, just going crazy. John comes in after the inning, and I jump him in the dugout, which is I rarely do. But I was, you know, I was, I was just upset. When the game is over, I jump him again in the clubhouse, which Paul Richards just said, if you're really upset, wait 24 hours. So I made a huge mistake twice. 
with anybody. But to make it with John made a huge mistake, unacceptable, unexplainable, inexcusable, whatever you said. And uh, because John maybe is one of the best teammates, one of the hardest competitors, one of the most caring guys, and the players knew it. So I was accusing him of stuff totally wrong. I was doing it in an embarrassing way. If I'd at least take him into my office, I would have been just been wrong privately, which would have been much better. I remember when that day was over, I mean, the, the guys all supported John. They were all over me, you know. When it was over, I walked into my office. I actually called Walt. I said, you know, I think I lost the club today. I really did. I said, I think I've, I've blown it. And I uh, just came back the next day and, you know, I made a mistake. I told the guy, hey, I just really screwed up. Hope it's the last time I screwed up. Probably won't be. And I hope you guys can understand, you know. How'd they take it? Well, I, I think the guys that were sincere. Now, on that ball club, I had guys like Eggers Lee, Stottlemyer, Honeycutt, that guy Ego that knew me from the past. So I had mm -hmm. some allies. And the guys that were, you know, kind of stiff arming me, they were starting to get back. I think I scared them off, and it took a while to get them back. And so we won that division that year. It's, just, it's one of the most satisfying ever because we started at zero, went up to about five, went back to about one, ended up at ten. You know? Almost got to the World Series. Up one game away. On the yeah, that's exactly right. You're 64 years old. You look like you're in great shape, still enjoy it, still have lots of energy for it. You go in year to year with the Cardinals. Can you see yourself retiring any time in the near future? What do you do without baseball? Well, I, I, I don't think I'd do anything without baseball. Uh, I remember Sparky told me, and I listened to everything Sparky ever said, don't quit ahead of time. Wait till it, it really the, the fire is out. So I go every, at the end, end of every year, I said, fire there, it's still there, and then does somebody still want me? That's what I'm going to do this year. But it, down deep, I know, you know, it's, this is 30 years, you know, enough's enough, and, and I, don't, I don't know how many more years, maybe this is late, I don't know. But all I know is baseball. So whatever else I do, has got to be baseball. I mean, I even talked to a friend of mine the other day. I says, maybe what I should do is be part of buying a minor league club, which I've always thought about. You go down there, you're still in baseball, and I don't know anything about business, learn a bit about business, so maybe that's what we do. The one thing above all else, I think people can, even those who may be your detractors, have to concede your success and your dedication to the game. I don't think everyone appreciates your true love of the game, not just as a profession, but it's something that you've loved since you were a kid and your tremendous respect for the game's history and for baseball people, behind the scenes baseball people, not necessarily the biggest names. That, that's, that's something I've always thought was a defining attribute of yours. Well, if there's one thing that I hope that becomes known and that when it's over that I'm remembered for is uh, you know, that true feeling, respect for any, everything and anything that's a part of the game. You know, whether you're working in a clubhouse or whether you're competing at whatever level. Uh, that's why, if you want to get me upset, anything, anybody or anything that works to the detriment of the game itself does not get any kind of pass with me. I get upset about it. You know, any agenda from the union or, the, or management or marketing or our individual player, you know, it's the game. The game provides this great opportunity for two teams to compete at the highest level. And if that is your focus, and we all try to contribute to that, that's the way I was taught, and that's, I mean, I'm, I'm really good with that. Anything that's not a part of that, that jabs at it, you know, I, I don't get happy about that. And if I had, you know, I don't have a lot of power, <clears throat> but if I had power, I would, I would deal with it. You leave Studio 42, you head for City Field tonight. The series is over by the time people see it on, on Sunday. But whatever tonight's game is, you're excited about it, right? You know, I'm excited because we're, we're competitive. The other thing, Bob, that, that continues to fascinate me, we don't have a crystal ball. We're talking now, we've known each other a long time. You're very smart about baseball, I've been around. We don't know what's gonna happen tonight. And the mystery of that ball game, us against them, fascinates me and, and uh, I'm excited about the opportunity to have more runs than the Mets do tonight. Tony, as always, thanks. Okay, my pleasure, enjoy it always. Tony LaRusso, that'll do it from Studio